Hey everyone, this is Dr. Markhan, and this is chapter 21 on the lymphatic and immune systems. So the lymphatic system is the main, its main function is to return excess tissue fluid to the blood vascular system. Lymphatic vessels collect tissue fluid. The immune system is a st system that protects our bodies from foreign organisms, be it bacteria uh, or viruses. Like, for example, now um, our immune system is trying to figure out how to battle the COVID-19 virus. And, you know, some healthy individuals are able to just walk it off while others um, are being hit very hard uh, by symptoms of the COVID-19 virus. So our immune system confers immunity to a disease. And the main components of the immune system include lymphocytes. These are the cells. Um, we all know what the lymphocytes look like because we saw them in unit one. Those are the uh, round cells, very small cells that look like a fried egg with a very large uh, centralized nucleus um, that looks like the yolk of an egg and very small rim of cytoplasm. Other main components of the immune system include lymphoid tissue and lymphoid organs. So now we're going to talk about um, different vessels within the lymphatic system. We know that lymphatic vessels collect tissue fluid from loose connective tissue. Uh, these vessels carry fluid to the great veins in the neck. Once tissue fluid is within the lymphatic vessels, it is termed lymph. So the fluid within lymphatic vessels is called lymph. And lymph flows only towards the heart. Functions of lymphatic vessels are to collect excess tissue fluid and blood proteins and return the tissue fluid and blood proteins to the bloodstream. So then we get into the different types and orders of lymphatic vessels. So the smallest lymph vessels are the lymph capillaries. These vessels are the first to receive lymph and are highly permeable vessels, meaning uh, they allow for uh, substances to pass through their walls. So these are highly permeable vessels. These are the smallest lymph vessels and first to receive lymph. Next, we have our collecting lymphatic vessels. These vessels collect lymph, um, collect from lymph capillaries. So lymph capillaries will then uh, drain, sort of drain into the collecting lymphatic vessels. Um, we have lymph nodes. These are structures that are scattered along um, the collection vessels. And then from these vessels, they then form lymph trunks. So lymph trunks will collect lymph from the collecting vessels. Um, and the lymph trunks will then uh, form lymph ducts. And these lymph ducts will empty into the veins of the neck. So first, we're going to talk about lymphatic capillaries. Lymphatic capillaries are located near blood capillaries and will receive tissue fluid from connective tissue. Um, they will receive an increased volume of tissue fluid. There are mini valve flaps that open and allow fluid to enter. Um, we, as we said before, lymphatic capillaries have a high permeability, which allows the entrance of tissue fluid and protein molecules. Also um, allowed to enter are bacteria, viruses, and cancer cells. Lacteals are structures that are specialized lymphatic capillaries. They are located in the villi of the small intestines. And we'll learn about the small intestines in the digestive system, but um, the majority of absorption, especially of our food, occurs in the small intestines. So lacteals are in the villi of the small intestines and will receive digested fats. Um, and fatty lymph is termed chyle. So uh, make sure you take note of this, of this term right here. Chyle is fatty lymph. So here we see the distribution and special features of lymphatic capillaries. So again, we start off with lymphatic capillaries, uh, which will then drain into collecting lymphatic vessels with valves. And along these um, collected uh, lymphatic vessels, we have lymph nodes. Here is a, a sort of a... Uh, dilated structure. This is a lymph node. So then um, these vessels will drain into uh, the lymph trunks and then eventually into a lymph duct and then back to the heart. Um, and then here we can see a capillary network. Um, 
our blood capillaries where we have gas exchange. Also in this area we'll have our lymphatic capillaries which are permeable to tissue fluid and, and other um, things such as bacteria and viruses and such. So tissue fluid all draining into um, the, the uh, lymphatic capillaries. So lymphatic capillaries are blind-ended tubes in which adjacent endothelial cells will overlap each other, and these will form flap-like mini-valves. So collecting lymphatic vessels will accompany blood vessels and are composed of the same three tunics as blood vessels. The three tunics we talked about being the tunica intima, tunica media, and tunica externa, or also known as the tunica adventitia. Collecting lymphatic vessels contain more valves than veins do and help uh, direct the flow of blood. Now, flow of lymph is not aided by heartbeats. It's actually propelled by three weaker mechanisms, and this includes the bulging um, of the skeletal muscles, pulsing of nearby arteries, as well as that middle, probably muscular layer of the tunica media of the lymph vessels. Now, lymph nodes uh, located along these collecting lymph vessels, they help cleanse the lymph of pathogens. And the human body contains around 500 lymph nodes. And we can actually um, palpate and appreciate uh, superficial lymph nodes that are located in the cervical region, uh, which is in the neck, the axillary region, which is the armpit area, and the inguinal region, which is located around uh, the groin. Um, normally we don't really palpate it too much. We might feel a little bit, but if we do palpate like enlarged or hardened lymph nodes, that usually could be a sign of underlying pathology or infection. We have deep lymph nodes that are located in the tracheobronchial lymph nodes. We have the aortic lymph nodes and the iliac lymph nodes. And this next figure shows you the location um, of our regional lymph nodes. So just general distribution of collecting lymph vessels and regional lymph nodes. So we have our cervical lymph nodes located in the neck, axillary lymph nodes in the armpit area, and then uh, inguinal nodes located around the area of the pelvis or groin. Okay, and we can see all these lymph vessels uh, that will drain up, um, and then we'll have uh, all of them draining into different ducts. So on uh, the right side of the body, you have uh, entrance of the right lymphatic duct, which will drain um, into the vein. And then you have the entrance of the thoracic duct on the left uh, into the vein and will uh, allow for this fluid to return back to the uh, right side of the heart. So then we get into the microscopic anatomy of a lymph node. Surrounding the whole entire lymph node, we have a fibrous capsule. Then within the lymph node, we have structures called trabeculae. Uh, these are connective tissue strands that extend inward to divide, to divide the lymph node into segments. Uh, we remember the type of connective tissue that we can find in uh, lymph organs, such as the spleen and lymph nodes, and this is a reticular connective tissue. Um, lymph will enter a convex aspect of a lymph node um, through the afferent lymphatic vessels. So afferent lymphatic vessels bring lymph towards the lymph node, and then lymph will exit a lymph node at the structure called the hilum. Uh, um, and then from there, they will exit through efferent lymphatic vessels. So lymph exiting uh, through the efferents or efferent lymphatic vessels. So when we look at the hilum, so the hilum, you'll actually see the hilum in other structures and other organs with, uh, throughout the body. Um, you'll see a hilum in the lungs, hilum in the kidneys, hilum in the spleen. A hilum is basically um, an area or region where vessels will enter and exit uh, an organ. So this right here, this area right here is called the hilum. So here we can see um, lymph will exit the lymph node uh, via the efferent lymphatic vessels through the hilum. Uh, lymph will actually enter the lymph node through afferent lymphatic vessels, and then the lymph node will have uh, different layers to it. The outermost layer is the cortex, 
Um, and then the innermost layer is the medulla, where you'll see medullary cords and medullary sinus. But in the cortex, you'll see these uh, lymphoid follicles as well as germinal centers. So these structures are actually important for uh, maturation and storage of your uh, lymphocytes that help fight infections. So again, we'll see these lymphoid follicles, and in the middle of the lymphoid follicles, you'll see germinal centers. And we have a whole fibrous capsule that surrounds the entire lymph node. And then within the inner layer of the medulla, you'll see medullary cords as well as medullary sinuses. So again, we talked about in Unit 1 how we have reticular connective tissue uh, located within lymph nodes and lymph organs, such as the spleen. Uh, here we can see um, cords of reticular tissue within the medullary sinus. So we have reticular cells on reticular fibers. And then we see our lymphocytes um, scattered throughout uh, the medulla, specifically uh, throughout the reticular fibers. So our lymph trunks, um, collecting lymphatic vessels will converge to form lymph trunks, and we have five major lymph trunks. We have the lumbar trunks that receive lymph from the lower limbs. We have the intestinal trunk that receives that fatty um, lymph or chyle from the digestive organs. We have the bronchomediastinal trunks, which collects lymph from thoracic organs or thoracic viscera. Again, when you see the word viscera, think organs, such as visceral layers. Uh, uh, usually these are the layers that are closely associated with the organ. And then there's a subclavian trunk that receives lymph from the upper limbs and the thoracic wall, and then the jugular trunks um, that drain lymph from the head and neck. So here are um, the different lymph trunks and ducts. So um, all the structures on the right, all the uh, lymph trunks will drain into uh, the right lymphatic duct, whereas structures on the left um, or trunks on the left usually will drain into uh, the, uh, the lymphatic duct. You can find that right here. Oh, I'm sorry, of the thoracic duct. So uh, structures on the left will drain into the thoracic duct into the vein. And here's just a gross uh, picture of uh, some of the different trunks. So we can actually see the left bronchomediastinal trunk. Um, and then we can see on the left part of the thoracic duct. So we have different lymph ducts. We have the cisterna chyli. These are located at the union of the lumbar and intestinal trunks. We have the thoracic duct that ascends along the vertebral bodies, empties into the venous circulation. Uh, the thoracic duct is, the jun is at the junction of the left internal jugular vein and the left subclavian vein. The thoracic duct actually drains three quarters of the body. Um, and then we have the right lymphatic duct that empties into the right internal jugular vein and the subclavian veins. Again, uh, receiving lymph that will eventually drain back to the right side of the heart. So the immune system recognizes specific foreign molecules. It destroys pathogens effectively. And we have the key cells of the immune system, and these are the lymphocytes. And we've seen them again uh, in Unit 1. The immune system also includes lymphoid tissue and lymphoid organs, and then these are the different lymphoid organs. You have the lymph nodes, uh, the spleen, the thymus, the tonsils, the aggregated lymphoid uh, nodules, as well as the appendix. These can then be further divided into primary lymphoid organs and secondary lymph organs. The primary lymph organs or lymphoid organs are where lymphocytes are generated and undergo development and maturation. Uh, primary lymphoid organs um, are include the thymus and not uh, listed here is the bone marrow. Um, thymus, the, when the, um, the lymphocytes originate from the thymus and, and uh, mature in the thymus, they're called T lymphocytes. For bone marrow, when they originate in the bone marrow and, and sort of mature in the bone marrow, they're called B lymphocytes. 
Um, the rest are considered uh, secondary lymphoid organs, uh, such as the spleen, the lymph nodes. Um, basically, this is where uh, mature lymphocytes will interact with antigen. So with regards to lymphocytes, uh, these are the cells of the immune system. Lymphocytes, um, basically infectious organisms will trigger an inflammatory response. And then these organisms are attacked by first macrophages. Again, these are the phagocytic cells that act like Pac-Man cells that will engulf the foreign invader. Um, organisms, foreign organisms are then attacked by lymphocytes. So lymphocytes effectively recognize a specific foreign molecule. The term antigens. Antigens are any molecules that induce a response from a lymphocyte. Uh, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, as we mentioned earlier, are the two main classes of lymphocytes. We have cytotoxic T lymphocytes that attack foreign cells directly. They bind to antigen-bearing cells. They can perforate the cell membrane and then signal that foreign cells undergo what's known as apoptosis or programmed cell death. Um, they will destroy virus-infected cells and some cancer cells. However, B lymphocytes become plasma cells, and these plasma cells secrete antibodies. Um, these antibodies will mark cells for destruction by macrophages. Um, and B lymphocytes uh, and plasma cells respond primarily to bacteria and bacterial toxins. So here we see um, different actions um, of different lymphocytes. We have actions of the cytotoxic T lymphocyte. So first, the T lymphocyte, once it recognizes a target cell, will secrete proteins that will lyse or kind of perforate and punch holes into the cell's membrane and then uh, signal that cell to die, so undergo apoptosis or programmed cell death. This T lymphocyte will then detach from the target cell, and the target cell dies by apoptosis. Uh, here we see differentiation and activity of a B lymphocyte. So a B lymphocyte will eventually give rise to what's known as a plasma cell, and this plasma cell will secrete antibodies. These antibodies will bind to antigens on bacteria, marking the bacteria for destruction. Um, and once it is tagged, the macrophages um, will phagocytize the antibody-coated bacteria. So with regards to lymphocyte activation, lymphocytes originate in bone marrow. Some will travel and mature in the thymus gland. Again, these will become your T lymphocytes. And some will stay and mature in the bone marrow, and these become the B lymphocytes. Now, activated lymphocytes are able to recognize a unique antigen, and this allows the body to gain immunocompetence. Um, activated lymphocytes will travel through the bloodstream, and then there they will meet and bind to a specific antigen, uh, and then proliferate rapidly. During activation, uh, the lymphocyte is presented its antigen by either a macrophage or a dendritic cell. Both T and B lymphocytes will produce clones of effector lymphocytes. These effector lymphocytes respond immediately, uh, then die. Uh, also, they can produce clones of memory cells. Memory cells will wait until the body encounters the antigen again, and this is the basis of acquired immunity. This prevents subsequent infections of the same illness. So here we can see a slide uh, showing the differentiation, activation, and recirculation of lymphocytes. So we both know both B and T lymphocyte precursors will originate in red bone marrow. With regards to mat uh, maturation, lymphocyte precursors are destined to become either T cells, um, uh, and these T cells will migrate in the blood to the thymus and uh, mature in the thymus. B cells mature in the bone marrow, and during maturation, the lymphocytes will develop uh, immunocompetence and self-tolerance. Self-tolerance meaning they won't attack themselves. So um, we, won't, we don't have uh, uh, antibodies that will attack our own self-cells. So 
seeding and secondary lymphoid organs and circulation. So uh, these cells are immunocompetent, but still uh, naive. So these lymphocytes have the th um, leave the thymus and bone marrow, and they will seed the secondary lymphoid organs and circulate through blood and lymph. Then we will have these cells um, encounter antigen and uh, cause lymphocyte activation. So when a lymphocyte's antigen receptors bind its antigen, the lymphocyte can be activated. And then we will have proliferation, proliferation and differentiation. Activated uh, lymphocytes will proliferate or multiply and then differentiate into effector cells and memory cells. Memory cells and effector T cells will circulate continuously in the blood and lymph and throughout the secondary lymphoid organs. So lymphoid tissue is the most important tissue of the immune system. There's two general locations of lymphoid tissue. You have uh, lymphoid tissue that are located in the mucous membranes of the digestive, urinary, respiratory, and reproductive tracts. And these are called mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue or MALTs. Um, lymphoid tissue is also found in the mucous membranes of the lymphoid organs. Well, except for the thymus. We know that the thymus is the... Uh, primary, uh, one of the primary lymph organs. So here we see an example of the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. Uh, this is an example of the, um, uh, the lymphoid tissue that we can see in the small intestines. Um, here is the germinal center of the uh, lymphoid tissue. So again, we talk about the primary and secondary lymphoid organs. Primary lymphoid organs include bone marrow and thymus. Secondary lymphoid organs include the lymph nodes, uh, spleen, and tonsils. We also have aggregated lymphoid nodules and the appendix. The lymphoid organs are designed to gather and destroy infectious microorganisms and to store lymphocytes. So here we see examples of the primary and secondary lymphoid organs. Again, we have the thymus being a primary uh, lymphoid organ, as well as the bone marrow. The thymus is located in the thorax and is most active during youth. And then we have our secondary lymphoid organs. Uh, we have some located in the tonsils, particularly in the pharynx. We have uh, our spleen, which is um, an organ that we can find in the uh, left upper quadrant, so curves around the left side of the stomach. And then we have aggregated lymphoid nodules uh, that can be located in the small intestine. Uh, these are called the Peyer's patches. And of course, the appendix is actually also uh, a lymphoid organ. So the thymus is a primary lymphoid organ. This is the site where immature lymphocytes will develop into T lymphocytes. The thymus secretes thymic hormones is most active in childhood. Uh, there are functional tissue atrophies, meaning the tissue uh, kind of degrades a little bit and, and degenerates with age. The thymus is composed of different layers. We have the outer cortex and the inner medulla. The medulla contains thymic corpuscles. Now the thymus differs from other lymphoid organs um, and functions strictly in lymphocyte maturation into T lymphocytes. Thymus will arise from epithelial tissue. So here we see um, a gross section of a cadaver. We can see the thymus located in the superior mediastinum. And if we do um, what looks like a transverse section or cross section of thymic tissue, we can see uh, the different layers. Of course, we have an outer fibrous capsule. We have the outer um, layer, which is the cortex and then the inner medulla and within the inner medulla we'll have and see these thymic corpuscles. So secondary uh, lymph organs include lymph nodes. <clears throat> the function of our lymph nodes is to um, allow for lymph to percolate through the lymph sinuses. Uh, most antigenic challenges occur in the lymph nodes so this is where um, your lymphocytes will come in contact uh, with their specific antigen. Antigens are destroyed and activate B and T lymphocytes. The spleen is actually the largest lymphoid organ, although the spleen is still just a secondary lymphoid organ. 
Um, it has two main blood cleansing functions. First, it's for the removal of bloodborne antigens, and then also the removal and destruction of old or defective blood cells. This is the site of hematopoiesis, or the uh, blood cell formation uh, in the fetus. So the spleen, um, we'll talk about, does become enlarged, especially if we have an increased destruction of, uh, of defective blood cells in, in such pathologies uh, such as your um, sickle cell anemia or different kinds of anemia that cause um, very abnormal shapes of the red blood cells, causing them, uh, causing their increased destruction. And this will cause a splenomegaly or an increased size of the spleen. So here in the spleen, we have uh, destruction of antigens. This is also a site of B-cell maturation into plasma cells. Uh, we also have phagocytosis of bacteria and worn out uh, RBCs, WBCs, and platelets. And the spleen is also a site for the storage of platelets. Uh, so we have different pulps that make up the spleen. We have an inner white pulp. Um, these are thick sleeves of lymphoid tissue. Um, here, bloodborne antigens um, are destroyed as they activate the immune response and also provides the immune function of the spleen. The red pulp surrounds the white pulp and is composed of venous sinuses, splenic cords, and is also responsible for disposing of worn out RBCs. So here we can see a diagram of the spleen. Again, the spleen is one of those organs that does contain a hilum. And here we see the splenic artery and the splenic vein entering and exit um, the organ via the splenic hilum. And if we see uh, a closer up view of um, the spleen, we can see the different structures that we talked about earlier. Of course, it'll have an outer capsule, we have the uh, outer layer of the spleen, which is the cortex, and then the inner medulla. Uh, we can see uh, splenic cords, uh, splenic sinusoids, um, and then we see areas of white pulp surrounded by areas of red pulp. And then we see the blood supply um, of uh, the splenic artery and, and the splenic vein and its uh, branches. So here is a gross view of the spleen. It kind of looks like the kidney, and oftentimes most students do confuse the spleen with the kidney, but the kidney, um, or the spleen, is um, a specific structure and definitely looks different from the, the kidney. Um, so, but it is located near uh, the left kidney, and above the left kidney we have the adrenal gland. Um, so the spleen kind of, uh, pushes up against the diaphragm, the diaphragm being a muscle that separates the, um, the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. Um, we'll see the splenic artery go along the superior border of the pancreas and then giving its blood supply to the spleen uh, going in through the splenic hilum. And here is a histo slide of splenic tissue. Um, again, we'll have white pulp surrounded by red pulp. We have that fibrous capsule that surrounds the spleen, and then we have the different layers, the uh, outer cortex and the inner medulla. So the white pulp um, is a lymphoid tissue with many lymphocytes. It is surrounded by red pulp containing abundant erythrocytes or red blood cells. The next secondary lymphoid organ we're going to talk about are the tonsils. The tonsils are the simplest of lymphoid organs, and we have four groups of tonsils. We have the palatine tonsils, the lingual tonsils, the pharyngeal tonsils, and the tubal tonsils. They are arranged in a ring uh, that help gather and remove pathogens, and the underlying connective tissue or lamina propria consists of your mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue or malt. So here are examples um, of uh, different types of tonsils. So there's the uh, pharyngeal tonsil located within the pharynx, the palatine tonsil, which is located um, at the back of your throat uh, or near the palatine bone, and then the lingual tonsil is the tonsil found at the base of your tongue. Then we have aggregated lymphoid nodules as well as the appendix. Again, we have that mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue that are abundant in the walls and the intestines. Um, 
These help fight invading bacteria, also generate a wide variety of memory uh, lympho lymphocytes. We have aggregated lymphoid nodules, specifically um, structures called Peyer's patches. And Peyer's patches are very predominant in the distal part of the small intestine. Um, and then the appendix is a tubular offshoot of the cecum, which is that first part of the large intestine. <clears throat> it is this structure um, that often causes a lot of problems, especially if um, it becomes um, inflamed. So appendicitis, anything that ends in itis, is the inflammation of the appendix and has to be removed by appendectomy, which is the removal of the appendix before it ruptures. Because once it perforates and ruptures, um, it actually becomes uh, quite dangerous. So here we see the aggregated lymphoid nodules in the distal small intestine. These are called uh, pears patches. Um, and then we can see the smooth muscle in the intestinal wall. And then here is the epithelial layer of the, um, the part of the intestine. Um, and then the centralized lumen. So we have disorders of the lymphatic and immune systems. We have chylothorax. Again, chyle is that uh, fatty lymph that we talked about. So chylothorax is just a leakage of fatty lymph into the thorax. Lymph angitis, anything that ends in itis means inflammation of. Ang is a uh, root word that means vessel. So lymph angitis is an inflammation of a lymph vessel. Mononucleosis, the kissing disease. Mononucleosis is a viral disease caused by the Epstein-Barr virus and attacks B lymphocytes. And uh, knowing about the uh, mononucleosis or mono, it often affects the spleen and you'll have um, an enlargement of the spleen called splenomegaly. And um, it is because uh, the virus will attack the lymphocytes and cause abnormal cells that need to be removed. Um, and usually it's an increase of these types of abnormal cells that will cause um, a, an increase in size of the spleen or splenomegaly. And that is why when you have mono, it's recommended that you don't participate in any sports because that could eventually uh, cause rupture of the spleen because of its enlargement due to the Epstein-Barr virus. So mononucleosis, the kissing disease, often uh, is transmitted, especially to students in high school. Um, I was fortunate not to get mono, even though my boyfriend at the time was infected with mono, but I was immune, <laughs> supposedly. But again, watch who you kiss. Other disorders of lymphatic immune systems, uh, we have Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is a type of cancer of the lymph nodes. And then we have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is an uncontrolled multiplication and metastasis of undifferentiated or immature lymphocytes. So these are two types of cancers uh, of the lymph nodes. So that is it for uh, chapter 21 on the lymphatic system and the immune system.